um, if you're interested in heat pumps and energy efficient buildings or Article 29 or all of the above, you've come to the right place. And now I'm going to be passing along to um, Cindy, who will be our first speaker, Cindy Ahrens. Thank you very much, Ken. So I'm going to give you a pretty quick overview. Like Ken said, we'll take questions at the end. Um, Article 29 asks to file a home rule petition that would allow the town of Lexington to create and enforce a bylaw amendment that would prohibit fossil fuel infrastructure in new construction and major renovations. Recommended by the Sustainable Lexington Committee, this article is a result of months of collaboration with Lexington Global Warming Action Coalition, Mothers Out Front Lexington, and LPS Green Teams, who together with Sustainable Lexington Committee make up the Clean Heat for Lexington Alliance. Article 29 aligns with state and local climate goals to renew, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act of 2008 commits to 80% reduction by 2050. The Lexington Select Board adopted the goal of net zero by 2043, and in our recent climate emergency declaration, town meeting overwhelmingly pledged to our young citizens that we'll achieve it, we'll achieve it by 2035. Fortunately, the recipe for re reaching zero emissions or 100% clean energy is relatively simple. We electrify our buildings and our cars, and then we green the, and we green the grid. This is a snapshot of Lexington's emissions from around 2015. Since then, our electricity has gotten greener each year due to state requirements to increase renewable emission-free energy production and our town's participation in the Community Choice Aggregation Program. On the other hand, fossil fuel combustion in buildings more than 80% of which is for space and water heating represents a prime opportunity for decarbonization. Article 29 is, a practical and cost is practical and cost effective in targeting electrification of new buildings and major renovations. As every building we build today with fossil fuel infrastructure defeats Lexington's emissions goals and will require an expensive retrofit in the future. We've come to learn that natural gas is not the clean energy solution we thought it was. In addition to harming surrounding plants and inhabitants, methane released from gas line leaks is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide in terms of global warming effect. Gas combustion from home appliances can cause indoor pollution levels higher than that of EPA limits for outdoor air. And although rare, Massachusetts has seen a number of gas explosion disasters, including one in Lexington in 2005. We need to begin the transition away from natural gas. Fortunately, clean heat solutions exist in the form of heat pumps. Heat pumps are very different from electric resistance heaters, which are expensive and inefficient. A heat pump uses electricity and refrigerants to move heat from one location to another, providing both heating and cooling. Heat pump technology has improved greatly in recent years with efficiency ratings from 200 to over 400%. Cold climate air source heat pumps, heat pumps can be highly effective down to five degrees Fahrenheit and some work down to negative 17 degrees Fahrenheit below the coldest winter nights in our area. They can and do work as the sole source of heating in winter. Here in Lexington, many buildings use heat pumps without any backup heat. So one might ask, if the electric grid is powered by fossil fuels anyway, isn't burning fossil fuels directly in a building more efficient? Actually, the current grid, with the current grid growth in Massachusetts, 18, at 18% 18 renewable in, in energy and growing at 2% each year, and with the Lex Lexington's Community Choice Aggregation Program, offering 100% renewable energy, 38% of which is local, heat pumps provide immediate emissions benefits over burning fossil fuels in buildings. When we get the entire electric grid 100% renewable, the benefits are even more staggering. Heat pumps are affordable. Studies by the Rocky Mountain Institute and Conservation Law Foundation both show that compared to natural gas, heat pumps cost less to install due to rebates, incentives, and the fact that this is a two-in-one heating and cooling system. Operational costs can be lower in the long term as well. And when compared to operation costs of propane or oil, heat pump savings are even more significant. Lexington's affordable housing and municipal buildings are already leading the way, creating healthier, more resilient buildings by way of electrification. Combined with good insulation, on-site solar ge energy generation, the long-term maintenance and operation costs are saving the town and its tenants money. So again, just to review the, the bylaw, this proposed bylaw asks to prohibit new fossil fuel piping in new construction and major or gut renovations. 
This is expected to affect about 100 buildings or approximately 1% of Lexington building stock each year. It will not affect existing buildings. It will not affect kitchen or other sorts of smaller innovations. It won't affect additions. There's also a number of practical exemptions in the bylaw for new piping within any new construction or major renovation projects. This includes piping for cooking and outdoor appliances, fireplaces, backup generators, for hot water heating for buildings over 10,000 square feet, and for space heating and life science lab and medical facilities. Repair of existing piping is also exempted. In the event that exemptions do not capture cases of undue expense or burden, a waiver process exists. And we, by setting the effective date of December 2022, we have adequate time for planning and preparation and education, like what we're doing tonight. Finally, a quick clarif clarification of why a home rule petition is needed. The town of Brookline passed a similar bylaw in 2019, and Attorney General Mara Healy found that while she strongly supported the policy goals of the bylaw, it was preempted by existing state law. Therefore, we need a home rule petition to allow the, a municipality's bylaw to supersede current state code. Home rule petitions are common. For example, Article 6 passed in our 2020 special town meeting had a home rule component. The towns of Brookline and Arlington overwhelmingly passed, passed home rule petitions and bylaws very similar to Article 19, and more towns are following suit. In conclusion, clean electric heating is healthy. It's affordable and comfortable. Article 29 is a practical, cost-effective, and necessary step for Lexington to reduce greenhouse gas, em gas emissions, to reduce pollution, to prioritize the health of its inhabitants, and meet our state and local goals. From all of us at the he Clean Heat for Lexington Alliance, we hope that you will support Article 29. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy the very informative um, sessions that are coming up. Uh, we do want to hear from you. If you have questions or concerns, bring them up tonight, visit our website. Uh, we have an email address, reach out to us. We want to, we want to talk to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Cindy. And our next speaker will be Jordan Goldner. All right, hello everybody. Um, hopefully this is all working. Um, so my name is Jordan Goldman. I am the engineering principal at Zero Energy Design. We are an architecture and engineering firm, offices in Boston and New York City and Portland, Maine. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, so this kind of dovetails a little bit with, uh, with Cindy's, what Cindy said, but um, just to give you a high level view about where our energy goes. Um, oops. Uh, buildings consume 40%-ish of our total country's energy use. Of that residential is 22%. So if we're going to get a handle on our addiction to fossil fuels and overall carbon impact of um, operational energy use, uh, residential buildings and all buildings, in fact, are a good place to start. Um, so we take an approach, as our name suggests, we specialize in very efficient homes um, that are super insulated, that are net zero, that are net positive. And we take kind of a ground up approach towards, uh, towards the overall performance. So the first step is to invest in the building envelope. So we put much more insulation that would otherwise be required by code. We put very good windows in. Um, then once you've got this very efficient building, we specify the most efficient systems possible so that we can meet our reduced energy demand in as efficient a efficient a manner as possible. And finally, we incorporate renewable energy systems such as solar panels um, to offset uh, the energy consumption. The idea is kind of analogous to the old recycling mantra of reduce, reuse, recycle, that the first step is to really you know, conserve energy, then consume it in as efficient manner as possible. And that leaves you a total energy use that might, will be otherwise much smaller. And any given amount of renewable energy will offset a greater percentage of a reduced energy demand. So here are some examples of projects that we've worked on. These are all super insulated net zero or near net zero buildings that are all electric, um, no fossil fuels. Um, so they can look traditional, like you know, homes in these homes in Lincoln and Wellesley. They can look modern, like this home that we did in Lexington. Um, and this home in Brookline happens to be a, a renovation of a home on the National Historic Registry. 
So there's really no reason why these sorts of strategies and techniques uh, cannot be applied to any design, any type of home. Um, so when we think about the efficiency of the envelope, it's important to define what's inside and what's outside. And everything that's inside needs to be separated from everything that's outside with a continuous insulation layer and a continuous air barrier. This is to you know, reduce your heat loss through the envelope. We like to think of it at home as a six-sided envelope, meaning that you've got four walls, you've got a hat, which is your roof, and you've got a bottom, uh, whether it's your basement or a slab on grade, you, know, you need to have insulation on all sides. The image on the left shows a typical kind of code compliant wall, which might have R21 cavity insulation, which due to thermal bridging through the wood studs is operating more like R16. Um, the two images on the right, which are what we prefer, are thicker walls that either incorporate a double stud construction, which is really just a way of thickening uh, the total depth of the wall, or a single stud plus continuous insulation on the outside. That's what the bottom one is. So you've got a continuous layer of insulation over the entire framing, um, which kind of acts as a jacket for your house. So we start with really good cavity insulation. This happens to be dense packed cellulose, which is a plant-based material. And then we add to it continuous insulation on the outside. The image on the right shows a foil-faced foam material, which we are trying to you know, kind of get away from as much as possible due to the fact that foam is a petroleum derived product and there's lots of you know, not so environmentally components to it. The image on the left is a rigid cork board. Um, so obviously a plant-based material, much more kind of environmentally sustainable due to um, low embodied energy. All of our houses get a continuous airtight layer. Um, fret not, this house did have windows, it did have trim, it did have eaves and overhangs. Um, but we have this defined airtight layer uh, that serves to eliminate infiltration through the house, which improves building comfort, building durability, and dramatically reduces your uh, operating energy. And then finally, we incorporate triple pane windows into all of our projects. Um, they perform much better because they're much better insulating, and they don't necessarily look any different than a conventional window. These ones happen to be a, an inward opening European style window, but that is a matter of aesthetic decision. We seek to make all of our houses um, fossil fuel free and all electric. And I would say 98% of them utilize air source heat pumps for heating and cooling. This is an electric based system that operates essentially identical to a central air system with the key difference being that it can reverse its cycle and rather than you know, extract heat from the house in summer, which is the way an, AC, uh, an air conditioner works, it can extract heat from the outside air in winter and deliver that to the house. And as was mentioned, you know, these systems work down into the negative teens um, without any backup energy. You know, their efficiency does suffer a little bit, but um, you know, the net environmental benefit of eliminating fossil fuels is, um, is really advantageous. So here is a graph from an energy monitoring system. So this is basically you know, looking at the way a heat pump, an installed heat pump that we have is working. This happens to be Mark's house, who is gonna be speaking after me. And this is in Lincoln on February 24th, 2015. The, the green part shows the amount of energy the system is consuming. The purple line shows the outside air temperature, which bottoms out overnight at a negative 11 degrees. The system just cruises right along. And note that this was not an especially low outside air temperature unit. Um, this one was rated down to five degrees, but as you'll see, it performed just well, just fine, well below that. And what you'll also notice, my favorite part of this, is that because we invested first in the envelope and Mark's house, during the day from about 10 o'clock in the morning to about seven o'clock at night, when the sun was out, the heat turned off. And it's not that Mark turned the thermostat down, it's just that the house was kept itself warm and you didn't need any heat from the heating system. So 
you know, when thinking about new buildings and new construction or major renovations, we like to design the envelope in a way such that the building itself, the house itself, does the majority of the work at keeping itself warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And then the systems are just there to supplement. Similarly, we use electric heat pumps for hot water as well. These are systems that extract heat from the air around them in the basement and deliver that to your hot water. If you have a house that, you know, I don't know, has a lot of AV equipment or you've got a separate um, fridge in the basement, there can be a really nice synergy in using the waste heat from that, those appliances, that equipment, that refrigerator or chest freezer and delivering that into your domestic hot water. So I mentioned the fact that we've got airtight assemblies for all of our houses. Um, that means that mechanical ventilation becomes critically important to maintain good, in, good indoor air quality. Um, these systems uh, provide a constant stream of fresh air, which is excellent and really important for occupant comfort. And these appliances um, recover heat and moisture that would otherwise be lost in the exhausted airstream um, as a way to minimize the energy impact um, due to ventilation. Of course, efficient appliances, Energy Star appliances, low water using dishwashers and washing machines and induction cooktops are, you know, we have found that induction cooktops are not just an acceptable alternative to gas in the eyes of our customers, but they are a preferable alternative to gas. So I know that the, um, that the initiative has an exception for, for gas cooking. I am personally of the opinion that that is misguided and it would be better just to require induction cooktops and, or other electric cooking and cut each of these new houses off from the grid and start to decouple houses from the gas infrastructure. But maybe that's a conversation for another day. Finally, LED lighting, it's much less expensive than it used to be. It's much better in terms of the, the color profiles of the bulbs. Um, you know, if any of you are still installing incandescent bulbs, please stop. Um, there are much better alternatives. And finally, renewable energy. So just about all of our houses get solar panels on the roof. And if the system is large enough, you can use excess solar production to power your car. So your house and your transportation can be powered by the sun. So, you know, we kind of talked a lot about the environmental benefits, but ho homes built like this are more comfortable because you have eliminated drafts. And because it's so well insulated, you've eliminated cold spots Throughout the house, you can sit in front of large windows in the winter and be comfortable. Um, because of the, the continuous ventilation, you've got healthier indoor air quality. The build, you know, because of the way the building is built, it's more durable. Um, it is quieter because you're insulated from, from the outside. Um, and finally, you've got you know, lower operating costs, lower operational energy, smaller carbon footprint. So I ask to all of you, which of these sound bad? Which, which of these don't you want? Um, so, you know, timing for doing this sort of stuff is obviously most effective during new construction when you can kind of design and build the building, quote unquote, correctly from the outset. Um, but for those of you in the audience who are kind of interested um, homeowners, you know, and you already have a house, you know, we want to kind of time these things to make sense with the measures that you're doing. So if you're replacing your siding or your roofing, that's a really good opportunity to add rigid insulation. This home on the right, which is getting new siding over just, just over a building wrap with no extra insulation has lost a kind of generational opportunity to improve the, uh, to improve the performance of the walls. If you're replacing your systems, hey, a great opportunity and great timing to, uh, to switch to electric systems. Um, and just to quickly wrap up a quick uh, case study of Mark's house. Um, this is in Lincoln. Um, very high insulation R values on all the assemblies, triple pane windows, and the, and the continuous air barrier. The systems are all electric using an air source heat pump, a heat pump water heater, and an energy recovery ventilator for fresh air ventilation. And finally, a photovoltaic or solar panel array covers all of his, all of his energy use, and then he generates about a 70% surplus on top of that. So you know, that could be used for electric cars, Currently, Mark, unless you've unless you've since bought an electric car, you know he's just banking a very large credit with um with the energy company. Um, and so with that, I thank you for your time, and I will hand it over to Mark.
Have you got me? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. We can All hear right. you. Good. Let me bring up my slides. Here we go. All right. So um, let's see. So let's go back here. So I, I'm Mark Dowdy. I'm the president and uh, owner of ThoughtForms. It's a company we've been in business since 1972. And we have always had um, sustainability in the DNA of the company. And um, sorry, Mark, your video I, isn't on. My video is not on. Let's see. Let's see why that might be. No, uh, Ken, can you actually bring it up maybe? Because I'm not seeing, seeing a way to, it says it's presenting. Um, I'm checking, it says, I see asked to start video. Maybe if I'm... Uh, uh, this is can, Cindy, can you... I, I can see his presentation. I just can't see Oh, you can. We can see oh, okay. your presentation, well, just not oh, your right. face. <laughs> You can see, you can see that you can see the better view then. So okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll go back to the presentation. Um, so um, as I was saying, so um, Mark Dowdy, president of ThoughtForms, but a um, number of other things, like I, I'm sure like many of you, I'm a parent. Um, I'm, my kids right now are actually skiing over at the Weston ski track and uh, also a veteran and, and a number of other hats. So I, I'm speaking from a, a bunch of different perspectives this evening. Um, the Cindy and Jordan covered a lot of the uh, items, which I think I, I could talk on. So I'll try and, and focus on some other items here. T tonight, I was thinking about talking a little bit about value. So instead of thinking about cost, thinking about the value of what we're doing here, um, discussing the opportunity that we have through uh, policy and through the built environment to provide my thoughts on some, some practical next steps for homeowners and for builders to talk about the cost and benefits. So I think there's already been some discussion of cost, but I think there's really a benefit as opposed to a penalty from building this way. And then share a little bit on um, our experience living in a high, perform high performance home in Lincoln. So the first piece here is I think I'd mentioned value. So when I'm thinking of value, I'm thinking that there's policy, which is what building code or, or other regulations say we, we should do. Um, there's personal understanding. So when we go to build something or to do something, it's, it's incumbent on us to understand what we're doing. And with the amount of misinformation in the world today, I think this is an area where it's really important for people to, to take the time to think and to learn. There's also peer influence. So it's kind of how do we fit into our community and, and into our social networks? And, you know, you look around, there, there is a tendency for people to, to follow the, the example of others. And I'm hoping that through these kinds of conversations, what, what people can do is start to set the examples that others will follow. And then I guess the last piece, cost does matter. And it comes down to what are we willing to pay in exchange for what we get? And I think as, as Jordan and Cindy both pointed out, we, there's, there's a lot that we get in return for, for investing in this. Um, to sort of set the stage, I think I, I, I love this quote from The Economist from back May 21st of last year when, when they were discussing COVID and they're saying, following the pandemic is like watching the climate crisis with your finger jammed on the fast forward button. And it just struck me as like a really visceral way of describing something. And um, what you can see on the right-hand side of this chart is the, the path that we're on right now leads to about a 3.6 degree Celsius temperature increase by the end of the century. And the chart at the bottom, I won't go into every little detail of it, but it talks about the different systems that support us as people. And the top of all those bars is right around 3.6 3 degrees. So just, just seeing that graphic, I think you can understand that's, that's a place we, we don't really wanna go. And that leads us to, to tonight's conversation about what, what can we do through Mark, we lost your audio. Mark, lost. Oh, that's interesting. Mark, we can't we Mark. can't hear you. Hmm. 
And we're just getting to the uh, the core of the presentation. So why don't we give him a minute and perhaps if he can't recover, we can move on to Craig and then see if we can bring Mark back afterward. Well, his presentation's not moving forward, so at least he knows that we can't hear him. <laughs> right. Unless everything is just frozen. He may be frozen in time, yes. All right. Well, maybe the best thing to do would be to move on to Craig, and that might give Mark a chance to reboot or rejoin the, the meeting and, and try again afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm happy to do that, Ken. Let's okay. see if I can get my screen up. Mark, I love where your presentation was going. I can't wait to see it when you can jump back on. So and, we, and uh, join us when you can. If somebody has his uh, cell phone number, maybe just text him. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the business of sustainability. And, you know, that's not necessarily new ground at all, but I come from a residential real estate perspective where it definitely is new ground that, you know, my team, my company is really rethinking our engagement with communities, with our customers. And I just want to share some of that work and what we're seeing out there, which is uh, really exciting in the marketplace. Um, so as uh, Ken said, I'm the chief sustainability officer for our company. We're the first residential real estate company to have a chief sustainability officer. Hopefully in five years, I'm not the only one because that means I will have failed. So that would be bad. So let's see if we can make a, multiple of them. And I'm lucky enough to work with the National Association of Realtors um, on this topic of sustainability. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a, in a few slides and some of the work that's gone on at NAR, the largest trade organization in the United States. And because of the work that I've done at NAR, I, I also serve on uh, some Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, task force that are looking at this topic pretty seriously as well. Uh, I run a team out of our Melrose office called the Rethink 39 team. And the 39 that we're rethinking is the 39% of US energy consumption that's attributed to the built environment. We feel like we can be a solution for every home that we sell, even existing homes that uh, aren't great because after the point of sale, at the very least, we can get them to mass save and start to do air sealing and insulation upgrades to their home. And who knows, maybe they'll move forward to heat pumps and PV in the future as well. Uh, but we're very committed as a team to slashing carbon one building at a time. And we're really excited about um, our, our engagement with consumers out there. But again, this isn't like new stuff or anything. Um, you know, here's a great example of S&P 500 companies that uh, started to do voluntary reporting, corporate sustainability reports. And you can see over this six year period, a huge growth from 2011 to 2016, that companies were realizing that uh, engaging their stakeholders, uh, sustainability and looking at a sustainable future was uh, a critically important part of their company uh, mantra. Um, on top of that, we're seeing numbers. This, this is numbers from uh, a marketing firm called the Shelton Group that National Association of Realtors uses quite a bit. Uh, Suzanne Shelton runs a company in Tennessee that does a lot of high level analysis on consumer engagement on this topic. And last year, one of the, one of the uh, pieces that she threw out was 74% of US consumers are basing purchasing company decisions on a company's environmental reputation. 74% are basing purchasing decisions based on a company's environmental reputation. That's a pretty compelling number. And, um, and something that we're thinking a lot about at my company and at National Association of Realtors about how we engage consumers in uh, a new and alive way. Uh, and we're not the only trade organization that's thinking about this. Certainly the U.S. Chamber, it will never be, um, uh, you know, nobody will point the finger at the U.S. Chamber saying that they're a bunch of liberal leftist uh, socialists that, that, that are engaged in the marketplace. And in September 2019, they made a pretty abrupt 
uh, about face on the topic of climate change and, uh, and have laid it out pretty clearly on their website that inaction is no longer an option for the US Chamber. That was a real driver for my trade organization to take a look at a new, to take a new look at how we can engage the public in a completely different way. And we all know this has been pointed out a couple of times here in the Commonwealth. There is certainly a political will to start to move this ball forward. Uh, and you know, there's no question that Brookline, uh, their town meeting vote uh, 211 to three to ban nat natural gas and, and new construction um, uh, in that town uh, was, was a driver. There's no question about it. We know it was already mentioned that uh, Attorney General, General Healy uh, voted that down because we have a state building code and this would have overran that. So now there's a lot of work going on with the new climate uh, plan that's, that's uh, moved forward twice in the last month um, to, uh, to look at legislation to allow several communities in the Commonwealth that, that would choose to do this to have a net zero energy stretch code for new construction. I'm pretty excited about that opportunity. I'm very proud that the community that I live in in Melrose would seriously consider this if, uh, if it moves through the legislature, which it has two times, and if uh, Governor Baker decides to sign, sign off on it in the end. So there's no question that this that this movement towards a sustainable future that we've seen in the business world and now is, is coming to communities here in the Commonwealth is very strong, it's very clear. Uh, even though there are members of my trade organization that have trouble with some of these issues, the reality is that there's a movement here that we have to look forward and embrace uh, be, because there, there's just a political will that's very, very clear right now. So what do we see in the marketplace? Well, there's no question that we see developers and we're lucky enough to represent uh, these developers in the marketplace that are building uh, way beyond code, delivering superior products. Cindy, I was happy to see in your presentation, the building on the top in Western Massachusetts was, was highlighted. Uh, this is a lead platinum home, 7,600 square feet. Uh, would have met passive house uh, requirements if we had decided to go down that road. 14.72 kW uh, solar PV system, per score of 19. Uh, luxury home. The units on the right were homes that I sold in 2018 in the Fort Hill section of Roxbury. Those were four condos and two buildings that were net energy positive. So not only were they net zero, but they were regenerative, that they uh, produced more energy than they were supplying to the grid. They had HERS scores negative 14 to negative 22. The great thing about that was under the Massachusetts um, um, okay. incentive okay. program, under the Massachusetts incentive program, okay. those homeowners, had the opportunity if they chose to own their portion of, own their portion of the solar PV system, that the incentive was so strong it paid for their homeowner association fees for the first ten years uh, of their ownership in that system through the SREC program. That was pretty compelling for the home buyers that were looking at properties when we sold these in 2018. In fact, we were competing with a code built home down the street that was built to stretch code levels because it's the city of Boston. Uh, so a, an efficient home. And we were worried because they were listed at 375 a square foot our homes were listed at 450 a square foot, which we knew would appraise out if we had uh, the, the appraisers that have gone through the Valuation of Sustainable Buildings program at, at the Appraisal Institute. But would buyers see that value of an extra 75 a square foot? I'm really pleased to say that all four of our units sold before two of the seven units sold down the street. So the market is seeing that there's a value proposition proposition here that is unique and certainly in the greater Boston marketplace, we're seeing a movement towards that. We're seeing buyers that are engaged. I, I put a, uh, a property in Somerville under agreement yesterday, uh, signed a purchase and sales agreement that was a high performance, uh, that is a high performance building, a two family that was retrofitted. My buyers are very excited. It has a 7.14 kW solar PV system on the rooftop along with very efficient building envelope. Uh, and that uh, 
uh, solar PV system is uh, divided with ownership interest between the two condos. So that's really great. Um, this picture on the left, I, I teach classes for real estate agents. And uh, I, I ask uh, class members, do you think that this guy, this was a home I sold in Reading in 2019. The guy with the infrared camera that's looking at the uh, R value of the home or, the, or looking at the leaks, uh, possible heat leaks in a home, do you think that this guy is a home inspector or do you think I was lucky enough in this pretty aggressive seller's market that I was able to get an energy assessment done on the home as part of the due diligence period? And the realtors go back and forth and they, well, they're seeing more home inspectors with IR cameras now. So they think it's the home inspector. Well, they're wrong. That's actually my buyer that showed up with an IR camera to take a look at the, the, the if the home had any evidence of, of it leaking. So we're seeing that buyers are terribly engaged about this, about this stuff, particularly here in Massachusetts, right? Because we have, a very volatile uh, power market, uh, energy costs are high. There is certainly an awareness of our own environmental footprint and our own individual responsibility. And for comfort and health reasons, uh, people are making these very smart choices. Uh, and we're also, believe it or not, uh, seeing lenders understand this value proposition as well. So Freddie Mac has a great new product in the marketplace called Green Cho Choice Mortgages. In Fannie Mae, these are both part of the GSE, so that's the secondary mortgage market. Fannie Mae has a, has a, has a product called Homestyle Energy. Now, what we're trying to do through Greater Boston Association or Realtors, my local association, uh, we sponsored a green loan roundtable for our lender affiliates at Greater Boston Association of Realtors. So they were aware of these products in the marketplace. And it's tough to get lenders in the room for anything right now. As you know, interest rates are incredibly low for my buyers that signed a purchase and sales agreement yesterday in Somerville. They're getting an interest rate for a 15 year mortgage of 2.35%. I mean, this is virtually free money. So lenders don't really have a lot of reason to get in the room to think about new mortgage products. But I was really excited that our green loan roundtable was full of lenders that were looking at these products very seriously. And I think the big eye opener for them was green choice mortgage that that Freddie Mac project product is really good for they, they actually fund resiliency improvements so if you're near the ocean and you need to put your home on stilts we have mortgage products that can start to deal with that from you know because we know that there's a changing climate and that's going to affect the mortgage industry so we need we need to have products that serve uh, uh, those kinds of situations and the other thing that our team is finding and our firm is finding is that people are really paying attention to this stuff. So two of my team's homes uh, in the last year were featured as the Globe Home of the Week. The one on the left was certified through a existing home green certification program called Pearl Certification. It's coming here in the Northeast. It's perfect for existing homes that are doing air sealing, insulation work, adding heat pumps, uh, that was Pearl Gold certified. And then the project in uh, Weston, which is a lead platinum project. So we see that people, you know, people are really paying attention to this stuff uh, in the media, media and, uh, and consumers. Um, here's a home in Salisbury, Massachusetts. I know the homeowner in which they built a high performance home. Um, and they put a power plant on their rooftop. As you can see, that power plant is producing income for the homeowners. I want you to just quickly run through your, your mind for a second and write down three numbers for me and add them up together. Now, I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not like gonna green shame you or anything, but write down these three numbers for me. One is the amount that you spent in the last year to heat your home. So just take a guess, you know, obviously that's winter months. What do your bills look like during the winter? Rough idea for the last year. That's item number one. Item number two, what do you spend for your utility costs? What do you spend to Eversource or National Grid or your Muni, right? So in the summer, your electricity bills tend to go up if you've got air conditioning. So give me a rough number for the full year, put that as the second number. 
The third number, and I've noticed, this is really exciting, Ken, that I've noticed several real estate agents are on tonight as well. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. So you realtors that are out there, right? You're running around all day long with your car. What does it cost you? Try to, try to come up with a rough number for me to run the vehicle that you use for your, for your real estate day. You know, how many times do you go to the gas station? Is it once a week? Is it three times every two weeks? What does it cost you to go fill up? Gas prices are low, so that's good, right? Get a month, multiply that by 12. So you've got three annual numbers now. Add those together. These folks have an electric vehicle, all of their heating, cooling. It's done through air source heat pumps, all of the gadgets, appliances, heat pump water heater. They spent 434 bucks for the entire year, including their electric vehicle. Compare that to your number. Now, there is no question that there's a value proposition there for homeowners out there. So that's the business case for sustainability, right? I, I just wanna end with what the moral case is as well, because we know all of us on this call, we're not stupid. We know that this decade is critical to dealing with some of this stuff. We know that policy and markets are changing before our very eyes. And you know, so I ask you to think about what you need, what you think your home is gonna to need to look like in 2025 or 20, 2030 to keep up with the marketplace because this stuff is happening whether we like it or not. But I ask you to think about that moral case as well, which is I think uh, even more critical. We've got to tackle this problem. You know, It starts in Lexington with the state of Massachusetts. Fortunately, we've got great legislators, like I think I saw Mike Barrett on, who's leading the charge. The Fed, you know, we've got a change of administration at the national level uh, that's moving the ball forward on this stuff. We know that this is happening. And, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's never a better place to start a revolution than Lexington, Massachusetts. So uh, that, that's uh, kind of where I want to end it, Ken, right there. But we're seeing this in the marketplace. There's no question about it. Thank you very much, Craig. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I see Mark is back and hopefully he will have his audio back. Yes. Can, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. And I think we can. All right. You. Let me get to put the spotlight on you as well. There, there must be some, um, some Moore's law equivalent for the larger the crowd, the more likely you're to run into a technology problem. Right. So, um, Ken, one thing I did, I switched computers. I don't know if it's possible for you to actually share the, share the slides. I think you had them pulled up. Um, yes. Let me find that. All right. Yep. Here we go. Okay. Um, and I see, I was glad, glad to catch uh, Craig's presentation because I now think that everybody else has said pretty much everything that I had intended to say. So this is where I can, I can make up, uh, make up the difference. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I'm not sure with this viewer how to go into presentation mode. So I think I'll just leave it the way it is right now. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay. And that one there is actually Jordan's. Oh, uh, that's Jordan's. Oops, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Oh, Perfect. there we go. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, that I can. Um, I know how to do Google Slides. There we oh, go. Good. And you also know where you guys lost me. So maybe if you could get me back to that point, and then I'll I'll try to pick up the thread. Um, it was this one. Perfect. Okay. So um, I I'll possibly repeat some of what I was saying on this slide, but the um the, the real points I was I was hoping to make here. One is. You know, this, this conversation right now is talking about a couple of different things. It's talking about policy, but it's also talking about the specifics of building electrification and efficiency. And if you look at the model on the right, um, you can see if you just go with carbon pricing, and I think that there, there's, there's, a, there's a belief in much of the market that if you put a carbon price that, that the markets will figure this out. And that may have been the case 20, 30 years ago, but where we are today, and I think Craig was just getting to this, is you know, we've, we've actually wasted a lot of time in addressing this. And so now if you go with an aggressive carbon price, you can bring the needle, you know, the, the temperature uh, at the end of the century down from 3.6 degrees um, increase Celsius to 2.9.
So, so the, the point here is that the, the, there's no silver bullet, like the, the carbon price is not the only answer and the markets can't necessarily figure this out on their own. And that's where, that's what brings us into this conversation tonight about building electrification and efficiency. Um, and, and one of the things I was saying <laughs> into, into thin air before, but this model on the right is uh, it's available online. It's um, one of the, it's a, it's a web version of one of the models that the United Nations uses for their climate modeling. And it's been designed so that people, like anybody can go in there and start to play with the different variables and the different levers we have to work on, on this issue. And, and what's, what's fantastic about it is it challenges our mental models for how we're gonna fix this problem. And it educates us and makes us better able to, um, to move forward. So on the next slide, um, what I was trying to come up with, and, and Ken, if you can jump to the next one, it was just, some practical steps. And I think we've talked about a lot of these tonight. I was trying to come up with something for, for people who are watching this, if you just want to go and, and have a single sheet takeaway. Um, one critical point here is picking the right partners. And, and part of picking the, the right partners is that we do need to shift society and we do need to invest in what matters and signal that by creating like some, some momentum and um, some critical mass around this. And, and what it takes to build homes the way we've talked about tonight is people who think about this and who are careful and they execute well in the field. So the air sealing details that Jordan showed you, like on my house, um, you know, one anecdote was, was Jordan came to do the air testing on my house and he brought the blower door, which is the equipment that they use to test. And he said, okay, anybody who, who wants to get out of the house um, in the next three hours, leave now because I'm about to seal it up to do the blower door test. And I was inside and I stayed inside. And about 20 minutes later, Jordan was leaving. And I said, is, what's wrong? You know, what happened? And he said, well, the house was so tight, we're done. There was really no additional work to be done. And so I, I said, well, how can that be? You know, this is the first house that we've really shot for this standard. And Jordan said that with typically they give five things. They say, you know, you have to hit each one of these five things. They, they impress it upon the building team that there are five things they have to work on. And he said, the, the reality is most people they work with only hit two or three of those five things. But by giving them five, they can generally get the bar in the right place. And, it, and he said, our team hit all five of them. And so they're really like, we, we ended up with an exceptionally tight house and it was all due to the careful craftsmanship and the collaboration of the team. And when you pick a partner, pick a partner that actually invests in their people and in their team, because the way that you get people who execute that carefully is they feel safe and secure at work. And it opens up all sorts of parts of their brain that they actually can engage intellectually and do things that you can't do if you're trying to figure out how you're gonna pay the bills at home or you know, so many other things that, that can plague companies that just aren't, aren't stable and, and set up this way. And, and you could say, okay, this is, this is like self-serving to, to talk about this, but I really hope that we have competition that makes it harder and harder for us to be perceived as you know, out front on this, because I actually want everybody to catch up. Um, going down like number two, we've talked about electrification. It's just, it's, it's just straightforward, it's not risky. Um, reducing the climate impact of construction, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, renovation is gonna be less impact than build, building new, building smaller. And then um, Cindy talked about the, the global warming potential of particular gases. Um, closed cell spray foam has a blowing agent. If you pick the wrong one, you undermine all the good work you're doing um, through, through the rest of your house, about an 80 year payback, and that's too long. And then um, how you handle refrigerants in the house, so how they're, they're handled during demolition or, or um, if there's leaks, fixing the leaks instead of just topping off the systems. Um, going down, the, the only other point I'll, I'll make on here is about measuring what matters. And this is an important thing in, in, in life in general. I think, you know, you measure what matters. You set that goal, you achieve the goal, and you get that little cortisol hit that tells you I've done something good. It's, it's the thumbs up on your social media post. And if you set the goal and you celebrate it and you spread the word, other people will follow you down this path. It starts, it starts to become something that, that people value. So um, now the cost on the next slide, 
I talk a little bit about the cost. Um, it's a good investment. I think this is this point's been made a number of times tonight. You know, we, we've done an analysis on two homes we recently um, worked on, and we came to about a one percent premium on the construction cost, the upfront cost, and that's predominantly due to the solar installations. Um, there's costs that go down, um, and there's also costs that go up. But in the end, it's really net savings. And I think again, this is the point that Craig made. On here, you know, we can talk about, it, but I think that the one that really that makes the point to me the most is if you are building a house today or you're doing work on a house today and you believe that this is the way that the world is moving in five years, if, if, if you're if the houses that are built after are built to this standard, what is your home going to be worth when you go to sell it in the future? So I think this is also a way to protect your investment in your home. And it's the biggest investment most people make in their lives. Um, other benefits, you know, reduced healthcare costs. There's a lot of research showing that there's reduced healthcare costs for people living in these homes. And there is an, it's a, a hard to quantify, but there's an emotional value. Um, and then in the next slide, Ken, the, um, for our home in particular, you know, Jordan's talked about our home. The, the one point I want to make on this slide is again, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a story, but it's an anecdote about our experience in the house. My, my brother-in-law is in his forties. And he has cystic fibrosis and, and a number of times he has almost died. Um, he has a hard time breathing. He's, he has a, a, no, a number of therapies, lives in Ohio. When he comes to visit us within 24 hours of arriving at our home, he, he comments on how it's easier for him to breathe in our house. And I think if, if, like, if that's not a sales point for a home or, or something that would make you feel better, I, I think uh, it might've been Cindy that made the point about the air quality in homes, we, we spend as Americans, we spend an average of 90% of our time indoors. And so we have regulations to take care of the air outdoors, but there really aren't any regulations that are analogous that, that take care of the air indoors. It's, 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 it's put on us as builders and as occupants of homes. Um, so I think that this is like, it, it, I'm just reinforcing a lot of the points that have already been made tonight. Um, maybe the, the last slide here, um, I think what I was what what I was was I was trying to put out was, you know, so this conversation is talking about something in Lex the 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 um, the law being put up, put forth in, in Lexington and, and I think what what I was thinking is what are the next steps what are beyond and where can we look outside you know Craig you mentioned a good place for a revolution to start is Lexington um, there's stuff happening elsewhere um, you know all electric requirement for systems replacements in Vancouver. Starting in 2025, if your gas-fired boiler um, needs to be replaced, you can't replace it with a gas-fired boiler. You can only replace it with an electric system starting in 2025. So that's happening in Vancouver. In Germany, they have something I, I, I don't know. I don't know the German word for it, but I, I, I call it like Title VI. We know Title V when you need to, to get your septic system compliant before you can sell your house. In Germany, in parts of Germany, they have a, they have laws where you can't sell your house unless it passes certain efficiency standards. So they've, they've built it into the transact, the transition point in homes. Um, and then even in Cambridge, as close as Cambridge, we're seeing um, additional fees placed on certain homes based on characteristics and size of the home. Um, innovation. So, you know, I, I own a business and I, I, I look at this from the, the person side, but if I look at it from the business side, there's money to be made in this, in our society, in our, in, our, in our capitalist markets. If we innovate and come up with the solutions faster than our competitors globally, then, hey, you know, this, this is what the, the national conversation is often about. Buy American. Well, if Americans are innovating and coming up with the solutions, it's going to be easy to buy American in this, in this market. Um, and the final piece, I think, is it's on all of us and the people who are on this call. Um, I think you're hopefully you're here because you're interested and in, in this conversation is something that, that motivates you to go down this path. That's, that's part of a social change where we start to value these homes in a way that we you know, value home makeovers and a lot of the things that we see that are pushed at us by the, by the media and by marketing um, engines within corporations that, that are trying to tell us what we want. If, if they see that we want these types of homes, they're going to start to, to, create that feedback loop that makes us more and more desirable for everybody and more socially accepted. So 
that's where I'd end. And then there is at the end here for our, um, when the slides are shared afterwards, there's a few resources that people can look to. So um, thank you for bearing with my technical difficulties. Like I said, the, the, it's something to do with the size of the crowd. The first one I've run into, but um, I hope that this, this time it went a little smoother. It had nothing to do with the house that we designed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thanks to all of our fantastic presenters. Um, what I'm going to attempt to do now is um, add a spotlight for all of the presenters so you can see them for the Q&A section. Hey, it's working. Excellent. And uh, one more person. Um, I'm also going to invite Claire McKenna, who is with the Rocky Mountain Institute um, an organization that uh, is consulting with uh, many communities around the Commonwealth on building electrification, including Lexington. Um, let's see, yeah, spotlight. And there she is. Great. Okay. Um, so I, if you bear with me for one second, I'm going to find the questions and we'll begin asking them. Okay, so uh, here's one that uh, I think is a good uh, um, starting question. Um, and this could be for um, anyone, but uh, it might be Mark and Jordan in, in particular. It's, uh, if residential heat pump technology is ready today, why do builders not already install it over some type of gas? Is it unfamiliarity with the technology, lack of installers, price difference, uh, lobbying from that na uh, natural gas industry or uh, something else. So. so so, I think what I would say on that is that we've actually been doing ground source heat pumps for 25, 30 years. And the air source heat pump technology, um, it's, it's comparable to chiller technology, which was more uh, deployed in, in commercial markets and larger in, in larger places. The, we actually have seen some improvements in the technology, but I do think it's just as much it's being specified by mechanical engineers and it's just become more acceptable and more expected. Um, and, I, and I think that's the primary driver is just sort of a bit of a social change a, and, and a belief that electricity and, you know, and the fossil fuels are not, not going to be as reliable in the future. Okay. Yeah, um, to the questioner's question, um, I think the answer is really all of the above. Um, there's an incredible amount of inertia in the general kind of construction development industry. Um, you know, more often than not, the answer to why some, something is done is because that's the way it's always been done. And this is an example of houses have been heated with fossil fuels for, you know, as long as any of us have been alive. Um, and this is this just re represents something new. And so obviously, you know, anyone who's been doing it for a while is going to resist new things because it's something that pushes them outside of their comfort zone. But truthfully, there's no good reason why um, why air source heat pumps can't be mainstream. Yeah, it's been widely deployed in Europe and Asia, and I think if you look around the world. There's you know or the country at least. New England is one of the only places where you see home heating oil. That's uh, that's a predominant thing, and so I think it's like Jordan said, inertia is a huge part of it. And if I could throw in, this is Cindy. Um, you know, the, the, the Article 29 that we're proposing, it, it's got a lead time, right? It's not going it can't it's not going to go into effect till sooner than um, December 2022. Now, some of us who are really believers, you know, want it to be in effect tomorrow. But um, I think that that lays out some good time for some more um, um, education and for people getting getting ready to make that to make that change. Because we know that the te technology is there. I mean, my 1985 house that doesn't have all this wonderful, wonderful insulation that I wish it did. Um, I'm very happy with my air source heat pumps. That's a good lead into another question. So, and I should also acknowledge the person who's asking these first few questions, Andrew Shank. So, thank you, Andrew, for your questions. Um, so, he had a multi part question. I'll try to summarize it. Um, it's his understanding that for air source heat pump installations, um, building heating load, or so it's related to the outdoor temperature. So how critical is minimizing the heat loss and is retro, therefore is retrofitting air sealing and wall insulation? Uh, how, how important is that? And uh, 
it's pretty difficult. He's asserting that it's difficult after con initial construction, which I think everyone would agree. So well, where should the, should the focus be on minimizing the heating and cooling loads or heat pumps or all of the above? What, what do you think is the, the right strategy here? That could be for any of our... I'll just say one thing, which is that um, I've heard many mechanical engineers say that ground source heat pumps um, are great if you don't even bother to insulate your house, that that's when you're going to get the most bang for your buck with the technology. Um, so, so I think others can probably speak more to the technical <laughs> underpinning for that statement, but um, so I'll turn it over. Yeah, I don't think that there's necessarily a right answer for all situations. I mean, as I harped on at nauseum, you know, yeah, we believe in reduced demand across the board. Um, you know, whether if you've got a fixed, you know, efficiency budget that you're working with and you're trying to decide whether or not that's best spent on efficiency measures or on new systems, you know, I think it depends on what needs to be renovated first. You know, the, the answer that I like to tell is do them both just phase them over time. And if you're doing things in a renovate, in a renovation fashion, make best opportunity, best use of every opportunity um, that arises. So when it's time, if, if your systems have crapped out, replace the systems. If you're, if you've got kind of um, envelope upgrades that need to be made, do it on the envelope. And then over time, whatever you didn't do will also need to be replaced. I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to throw in there, sorry, that um, uh, because this uh, article applies to new construction or major, you know, gut renovations, right, not, not just small additions. So, and I know that there's a lot of people here that are, that want to talk about their existing home and retrofitting their existing home, which I think is great. But in terms of uh, the new construction, um, we've talked to Lexington's building department and, and you know, the new homes. We have Lexington is a stretch energy code town has been for a, quite a few years now. Um, and in terms, I don't want to go into too many details, but the, the rating, the HERS rating that's required for stretch energy code is 55. The typical homes that are being built, new homes in Lexington right now are in the, in the range of high 40s. So the lower the number, the better. So again, that they don't, they're not having, um, or, or, or some, a lot of them that are not like sort of custom built to these great things that Jordan and, and Mark are talking about, um, but they're still doing better than even the, stre the stretch code. And so that um, is, it just clearly, I think that even even with that type of insulation, it, it's, you know, going with air sort of peep, some peep pumps is, is a no-brainer. And, and, and Jordan's baby agrees with me. Yeah, exactly. Claire, I think you had something to add. You just had a burp. It's okay, everybody. <laughs> yeah, um, I was. I'll hold my comment because I was going to dive into more on retrofits. Um, but if if there is time, maybe at the end. I, I think it, um, Cindy's right in focusing the conversation on the new construction and the major renovation. Um, but I can say more um, if if folks are interested, maybe to stay after to talk about what what the uh, kind of retrofit scene will look like in the next thirty years or so. Mm -hmm. I think Ken, just one, one thing I couldn't tell if it was embedded in that question was if the question is, can air source heat pumps keep up the load in a poorly insulated or a leaky home? And I think the answer there is yes. So I think if that if that's the if that's the other question, you can put in an air source heat pump to replace a gas fired furnace and come keep your house comfortable and you know easily heated on the coldest days. Well, one use case too for for existing homeowners. You you mentioned Mark uh, uh, oil heat up here in the Northeast. Uh, only eight percent of homes in the United States are heated with oil heat, but eighty percent of those eight percent are up here in New England, right? And one good use case. I mean, typically, you know, oil heated homes don't have AC, so using a heat pump system to at least supply the AC and you could experiment with heat pumps at, as your primary heating source and keep the oil heater as a backup for those really cold days isn't a bad way to go too and add AC. Um, another question, uh, some of these were answered in the chat but I'm not sure if everyone was following the chat The it was flying by pretty quickly, um, which was that forced hot air is generally not comfortable, too hot or too cold, and produces dry air, which is not good for breathing. 
Uh, Jordan, you had answered that in the chat, but maybe you don't want to uh, repeat your answer for the rest of the audience. Yeah, sure. Um, so a conventional forced air system that you know maybe the furnace that burns gas is delivering air in the you know 120 degree Fahrenheit range. Whereas an air source heat pump, you know, just due to the kind of thermodynamics of the situation, is producing more like 100 degree air. Um, so obviously there's a reduction in capacity if, uh, if as the air temperature decreases, but you know, the 100 degree air is typically sufficient. And that lower delivery temperature just kind of treats your sinuses much better and much nicer. Um, it's much less of a blast of desert into your nostrils. And, um, you know, the other thing to, to kind of harp on is that if you invest in the envelope and you reduce your demand much more, then the amount of air you need is much less, the ductwork is less, the systems are smaller, the capital costs for your systems are less, and how you heat and where you heat and the distribution and all of that all of a sudden matters much, much less than in your poorly insulated, single paned, might as well be outdoors house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a question from Edward Dolan about the um, unconditional exception for life science buildings and uh, why, what's the rationale for that? He's saying it seems that they might be able to, they're quite profitable, they might be able to afford uh, paying, you know, to share the burden of sustainability. So maybe that's just a, a broadening that a little bit. Um, Cindy, could you shed some light on some of the uh, thought process behind the, the exemptions and the in that are yeah, in the world? De definitely, definitely. Um, anybody that's on town meeting or involved in the town is is you know knows knows what life science buildings we want life science buildings in our Hartwell Innovation Park. Um, what we found uh, is, we learned a lot, um, including with uh, some some work at spe the last special town meeting is that life science buildings. So when you're doing a lab work or even a production of of uh, biopharma, uh, you you especially in in the winter you have to well all the time you have to move a lot of air. This happens a lot in hospitals too. You have to move a lot of air. And in the winter time, you have to move a lot of warm air because you don't want the people in, in these labs and production facilities to, to be cold. And so that winter time, one of the reasons why it's difficult to use heat pump technology in the winter for uh, lab buildings is, is because of that that the technology is not quite there yet. We do have, we know of some life science buildings that are actually um, under construction. I think maybe they've broken ground um, in Cambridge, in, in, in Boston, that are using uh, what people are calling as a hybrid uh, sort of system where they're using air source heat pumps for, for, for most of their um, uh, space heating in these life science buildings. Um, but you know they do have a, a fossil fuel based system for for the um, for the rest of the time, we're we're really excited to see you know what happens there and 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 think that that's a, the way we can go. But in in, in a nutshell, that's why um, life sciences are exempted for this uh, for this uh, article. Um, back to some of the uh, more practical questions about the uh, building these homes. Uh, here's a question about uh, the the lower installation cost mentioned for heat pumps. Is that true for all homes or just new homes? So, so when you're installing the heat pump, the um, one of the benefits is that, as Jordan was, was alluding to, you get your heating and cooling from one system. So you're bringing one subcontractor on site to deal with that, and you're, you're installing one system as opposed to duplicating the equipment and having two different subcontractors working on it. Um, if you happen to be heating with propane and you want to connect to a gas line, that you're also eliminating all that site work associated with um, bringing underground utilities or or having you know propane tanks buried on the site. So so there, it's it's that 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 benefit accrues in all cases. Okay. Yeah. Complicating factor. Oh, complicating sorry. factor is that um, for most existing houses in Massachusetts and the Northeast. Uh, they're not heated with forced air, they're heated with forced water, with hot water radiators. Mm -hmm. um, and the majority of air source heat pumps are what are called air to air heat pumps. They're taking heat out of the outside air and delivering it to the indoor air. Um, there are a couple products out on the market that are air to water heat pumps, which I think will be game changers 
uh, as far as the retrofit scenario is going to be concerned. But if you've got a forced water system, there is an infrastructure challenge with putting in an air to air heat pump, you know, just the upfront cost of the ductwork is, is quite expensive, you know, compared to not having to change any, any of the infrastructure, but now you have central AC. Right. Okay, great. Um, there's a, another related question, which is how easy is it to replace a central air system with a ducted heat pump system? I know Cindy has some experience with this, but our experts might have something to say. This one is uh, of interest to me as, as well, because that, especially um, for those people who have uh, forced hot water heat and the central air system, could they put in heat, ducted heat pumps that would take care of both heat and uh, cooling? Yeah, easy peasy. Okay. Next question. Okay. <laughs> um, that's great. Okay. So um, actually, Claire, you wanted to say something about existing homes. So why don't you do that while I scroll through the... Uh, some okay, questions. sure. Um, I, I just wanted to mention um, that I'm currently working on a pretty comprehensive study of retrofit, um, basically consumer economics for, for single family retrofits. Um, I'm studying Boston. Um, I think it's pretty applicable from the climate zone perspective across the Commonwealth, um, <laughs> certainly for, for uh, Lexington. Um, and it's not quite published yet, but the insight there is that, yeah, the, um, the, the, the feasibility of uh, a centrally ducted system is, is, is high. That, that the, that's the kind of uh, retrofit we studied. Um, and I can follow up more on the first cost, although you might want to consult you know, even more locally with, with some of the, um, the folks that are actually supplying those services. I mean, mine, the value of my study is, is kind of like a comparison across cities in the US. Um, so I think if you wanted answers about, could you do this for your home? Um, you, you would wanna consult with some of the folks on the call here. Yeah, if I might give a shameless plug, um, a month or two ago, I wrote an, an article for Fine Home Building, um, which is a very kind of detailed point by point how to install an air source heat pump. And so if you search my name and find home building, and if you don't have a subscription, you should get a subscription because it's a great publication and we should be supporting good publications. Um, and you'll get probably more information about air source heat pumps than you ever wanted to know. Okay, great. Um, there's another question about um, instead of, uh, Instead of prohibiting gas heating, why not require a higher level of air sealing and, and insulation that Jordan spoke of? Um, and that the compressor AC and compressors must also support a heat pump mode. So I think, Cindy, you may have addressed that to some extent, but it may, it's just another wrinkle on the question about what um, we talked about exceptions before. Now this is you know, why the focus on electrification versus insulation. Versus insulation. Yeah, I, I, it's a good point. Um, I, I guess I sort of feel like we, we've got to start somewhere, right? Um, we, 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 this is part of Lexington's getting to net zero emissions plan. It, it's in there. We, we, we've got to start somewhere. Um, and, and as I said before, I mean, there are there's some really good stuff happening out there with, with, with insulation, um, and we should be talking about it, definitely. Um, but you know, I, I think that let's, whoever asked that question, let's, let's have a talk and we'll see, you know, what, 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 what else maybe we can do. And Claire has something to say. Yeah. I just want to connect it back to the broader movement. Um, uh, the, the, uh, mass decarbonization roadmap and the, the Massachusetts 2030 clean energy and climate plan. So this is state, um, you know, j just reduce, uh, produced in, um, in December 2020 by the Executive Office of Energy Affairs, right? So the, the governor's office looking at, um, you know, what the Commonwealth needs to do to meet the um, global warming solutions, climate emissions reduction targets. Um, and building electrification is in their front and center. Um, and so this, um, you know, this home rule position really aligns with that. And so um, we need to transition from gas. It's, it's non-negotiable at this point. And so um, from, from, the, from the perspective of, of the, uh, the Commonwealth. So that's, that's kind of, we do need both, um, but we can't do one and not the other. I mean, I think the, simp the simplest form is that you can't negotiate with the climate kind of like you can't negotiate with COVID or a lot of these things that are natural. And we just can't keep putting carbon into the environment. And as long as we're using carbon-based, heating systems 
we're putting we're putting it in the environment. So I think the that that's where the electrification part comes from, and it doesn't it doesn't mean you shouldn't be spending effort on reducing the load. It just means that you you have to get rid of the the fossil fuel um, in the home. And I don't. I, there's one other thing I want to add, and I don't know if there's a question um, there, but um, in terms of there are, you know, incentive and, and rebates. I touched on it um, a, a little bit before, and and we're we're hearing, you know, th this is this is stuff that all everyone is paying for in their in their electricity bills, um, in, in their gas bills. They're paying for rebates to give back to people to move in this direction, and and the rebates are for insulation and for you know electrification so and they are for um new home construction for for renovations and for and for retrofit um and there's there's some there there's even um uh, the uh, DOER, the Department of Energy uh, Resources, I think, in Massachusetts, um, even if you don't have solar panels on your house, you can get alternative energy credits by moving your house to an all-electric house, by moving your heat system to an electric um, heat system. So uh, there are um, lots of lots of incentives out there. I know it's unfortunate that um, you know some of these are, are sort of you have to contact different people and do different things. Um, I think from from our our group and our alliance, we we do want to also get a lot of that. Um, sort of awareness out there and reach out to people and help them navigate that. Um, there's some of that is on our, our website, cleanly, uh, cleanheatlexington.org. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that we talked about incentives and rebates if there wasn't a question that came up about it. Thanks. By the way, I just um, added a link to the, um, the Clean Heat Lexington, excuse me, Clean Heat Lexington website. Um, it's actually the um, page about the home rule petition, but there is also the uh, the main page, the home page. I'm going to put that in there as well. So there are lots of it. some of the topics that Cindy spoke about are already covered there, and uh, we're going to have not be able to answer all of the questions that are being asked tonight. There are lots of good questions, um, and it'll give us some ideas for putting additional information. So I encourage you to bookmark that page and come back to it, and it'll just keep. Uh, Getting better and better as time goes. Um, there's another question that just came in um, that uh, about power plant, the grid and power plants. So it was a question about um, don't doesn't it take fossil fuels to produce electricity? Um, and so maybe we could speak about Cindy. Could you also just talk about the um, community choice and how we get our electricity in Lexington? Yes, I, I learned this from some people on this call that are a lot smarter than me about this, uh, this whole thing. But um, yes, it, our, our electricity or some of our electricity now is, is, is from fossil fuels. But the requirement of the, right now, the, the state requirement is that all new electric, electric production has to be at least, you know, 18% of it has to be renewable. Um, and that is going to go up by 2% each year. Um, in the town of Lexington, our, our default um, community choice aggregation program um, puts that up to 38%. So we have a, a requirement if you, if you are in the community choice uh, aggregation program that 38% of the you know, additional um, needs for your electric heat pumps will be from renewable sources, which are mostly solar and wind. Yes, there's some other... Um, uh, re quote unquote renewable resources that do have some emission factors, but it's mostly solar, mostly wind. Um, again, a lot, you know, if anybody wants to really get into the nitty gritty of the calculations, I will hook you up with the right people that, uh, that, that can help you out with that. And Claire wants to say something. I just wanted to say I, that's, um, that's my area of expertise and I've been running a lot of analysis um, for this topic. Um, I, I linked uh, a recent article that I wrote in the chat. Um, I actually looked at um, for every state um, in the country, you know, where, where, where the break even point was on an annual basis for um, switching to, um, to a heat pump today. So because it's a, a, a common question and, and a really good question, uh, really insightful regarding, you know, where our electricity comes from. 
Um, but but the truth of the matter is that um, because of Massachusetts renewable portfolio standard and the renewable targets and you know the increasing commitments also from the municipalities to, to procure um, renewables on the on the on their grid um, uh, uh, a new home purchase today that includes a heat pump um, over the course of its lifetime uh, will will pay back an emission so we'll have a net negative emissions um, compared to a, a fossil fuel um, furnace or and, and boiler combo. Um, so that's really important because um, essentially we need to make sure that we're not digging this hole deeper. I know that that's Mark Sandy's line. And, um, and so, but, but the fact of the matter is when you look at all of the, um, you know, the, the comparisons, um, both of efficiency of the equipment and also the, where the energy is coming from, um, you know, it, it, it actually does reduce emissions to invest in, in a heat pump today. Yeah. yeah, it's important to note and drive home the fact that we've we've lost the luxury of incremental change. And we're at a point where it needs to be all together. You know, we need to stop burning fossil fuels, be it on site, at the power plant, everywhere. All the energy needs to be renewable. Um, because, yeah, we waited too long. I think the other piece to add to this, too, is we know that, you know, infrastructures are really tough challenge, you know, we're, we're that's, this is a topic that National Association of Realtors is really looking at, um, engaged with uh, pretty seriously right now. And we know the infrastructure challenges here in the Northeast. Uh, we know the natural gas infrastructure challenges that have already, we've already mm -hmm. seen evidence of, of that happening, uh, you know, negative consequences of that. And we have an opportunity right now with this technology that's here, it's cost effective, it's comfortable, it, it gets the job done to, to move forward. Right. Great, um, so I think I'm going to wrap up with one more question. Um, and it, I think there are two parts of it, all interpreted in two ways. The question is what return on investment will I get on these type of uh, gut home renovations? And I think there are really two aspects to that. It's as okay. the, homeowner living in the home, what kind of ROI will I get? And then um, down the road, when I sell the home, um, what will the impact be of, of having made these uh, improvements to my house? Well, so, if, if I could just take a first pass at that, because this is something that I often hear, it's, it's, it's presented as, as sort of a choice. Do I do this? If I'm going to do a gut renovation, do I do it this way or do it the other way? And, and the analogy I use is if, you, if you're going to go and buy a really nice dinner somewhere and you walk into one restaurant and you're going to pay 50 bucks for that dinner and they're going to burn it and it's going to be served to you on a dirty plate. Right? Or you can walk next door to a restaurant and you can pay $50 and they're going to give you the best meal of your life. It's a pretty, I mean, I don't know many people want to eat off a dirty plate, right? If you're going to actually go through the effort of doing a significant renovation on your house, you're not going to pay a premium to get a much better, better product. And so, so I think if, if the question is like, you know, doing a renovation this way or that way, then I don't think there really is a question there. And then if the question is, is it worth going to the step of doing this major renovation just to get this result? I would say that's a, on some level, it's been discussed by a number of people, you know, do it at the right time. You know, putting an air source heat pump in now, if you can afford to do that, makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, even if you have a, a brand new gas fired system in your house, if you, if you want to take a step and you can afford it, there's no harm in stopping using fossil fuels today. So great. I can, and Craig, how about uh, from the perspective of resale? I can take the second question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I would say just like there are some, as you can see with Jordan and Mark and, and Claire and Cindy, there are some there are some home performance pros on here, right? There are builders that build to high performance levels. They're different than people that are building to code built homes, right? Believe it or not, there are realtors that are trained specifically in marketing and valuation for these homes as well. So I teach a class for, for real estate agents called the Green Designation, which is a pretty intense uh, class for, for realtors in the room that look to a deep dive on building science, but more importantly, marketing and valuation. Evaluation. And believe it or not, despite what you may hear from a local realtor that doesn't have their green designation and they're not knowledgeable and competent in this part of the real, real estate industry, there are appraisers that value this appropriately as well. So the Appraisal Institute has a very rigorous three-course set 
uh, to achieve a valuation of sustainable buildings credential behind appraisers as well. So the great thing about a green designated agent is that even though we can't pick a specific appraiser, we can demand a qualified appraiser. And as we can tell from Mark and Jordan's presentations that these homes are different and they demand an appraiser that understands the valuation process of it. So if you do not pick the right actors, as Mark said, pick the right partners, right? If you don't pick the right partners, you're not going to see uh, the value at the point of sale either. So this is, you know, this it's great. Uh, great question, uh, and it, I think it feeds exactly what we've been talking about through this whole presentation. There, there are specialists that really care about getting this done right across the industry, including lenders. As well. To all of our panelists and to everyone who attended, um, I noticed at one point we're well over 150 people, so there's clearly a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, we're considering doing some additional sessions um, in, in the coming weeks. We built this website and we'll be putting more information and we will certainly send out an email to the attendees uh, to try to answer some of the questions that weren't answered or at least provide links to resources um, where you can uh, educate yourself and, and learn more about this. this topic. Right, and we'll, we'll send the recording to um, people you know. I know some people who couldn't make it tonight that we're gonna send the recording around. Um, that, that's right, and it's also being recorded for Lex Media as well. So it will be available there as well. So um, fantastic discussion. I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did. And uh, we want to thank everyone um, for joining us. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you all.